What does it mean to be human? Is it your sense of identity? Is it your personality, your consciousness? How does our concept of the mind and definition of humanity change in a cyborgian future? Hi, I'm Harrison Canning, and in this video, we'll discuss the effects of neurotechnology on the mind through cyborg theory and transhumanism, centered around the question of, what does it mean to be a human? We will learn how we can set up a framework for the discussion of technological development that helps to ensure safe and ethical use of neurotechnology. Let's transport ourselves to a future where you're fully on board with modifying your brain and body with various technologies so that you can become a space-faring, time-bending, hyper-intelligent superhuman. But what about the second part of that word? Are you still human? Was there some part of you that was lost or gained when you added a chip to your brain, or traded your biological arms for more capable mechanical ones? The Grecian thought experiment, the ship of Theseus, asks an analogous question. If a ship travels from one city to another, and all of its parts are replaced during the voyage, is it still the same ship when it reaches its destination? In the same light, if you replace parts of your body with more capable mechatronic ones, are you still you? Are you a cyborg now? And what are cyborgs? Are they still human? Is there a point when someone stops being a human and becomes something else when modifying themselves with technology? Could a downloaded consciousness into a computer be considered human? Of course, the above questions are a little bit extreme for today, but we feel it is still worth asking. Even today, many commonly used clinical neurotechnologies leave patients with mixed feelings. Sometimes users report that they feel that their devices have become a part of them. Sometimes they even name them. To others, these implants are constant reminders of their ailments and disabilities. Before we dive much deeper, I feel that it is important to note that, although we will be discussing the idea of humanness as a term, we are not suggesting or permitting the idea that people using assistive technology today are any more or less deserving of rights or are any more or less human. The goal of this section is to start a conversation around our interactions with technology. For this discussion, we ask you to accept some liberties and think about devices that are currently on the outskirts of our imagination. As is true with all philosophy, there are no correct answers, only ideas. Colin and I, in planning this video, have done our best to put our opinions to the side. We will present a series of questions, making effort to represent different schools of thought on each subject. If you're interested in our thoughts, we will provide our own opinions to these questions below this video. For now, we encourage you to take some time with each question to formulate your own opinions. Before we jump into the cyborg stuff, let's first think about the current boundaries of being, the mind and body, and how that relates to our identity. Questions surrounding the mind such as, what is it, where is it, and how it works have mystified philosophers for as long as there has been philosophy. Plato, Kant, Nietzsche, Descartes, the Buddha, and Averroes have all offered their own compelling interpretations of the mind and what we can do with this information. We cannot possibly cover all of these ideas in this video, so I will make some generalizations, but the description or written content below will include access to more resources if you want to expand your knowledge. There were two primary schools of thought that were pervasive in pre-modern times, dualism and monism. Both concepts attempted to explain the relationship between the mind and the body, coined the mind-body problem. Dualists believe that the mind and body are two separate entities. The mind is a loosely defined non-physical entity that cannot be reduced into smaller pieces. The mind is the mind is the mind. It is this idea that produced Descartes' now famous quote, I think, therefore I am. In this, you can see a belief that his existence, identity, and being are all part of the mind. Descartes believed that God is pure mind and that a rock is pure matter. He believed that humans combine both of these, having a mind and a physical body. Dualists believe that there is interaction between the body and mind, of course, but they see them as two distinct entities, and that the mind is not necessarily confined to the body. By contrast, monists, which comes from the Greek word mono, believe that the mind and body are one inseparable entity. The mind originates from the body in some way. 
philosophers of this creed have sparred over where in the body the mind resides and what processes create it. But again, they think this link is inseparable. The understanding that the brain is the seat of consciousness and the insight we have gained into how the brain works has led modern philosophers to largely adopt reductive physicalism, which stems from monist ideas. Reductive physicalists believe that the mind arises entirely from physical properties of the body, more specifically, the brain. They further believe that this can be continually reduced to increasingly smaller areas and processes as neuroscience advances. They would argue that consciousness and the mind will eventually be understood completely once technology advances enough. A challenge to this theory is mysticism. Mysticism holds the idea that the brain is too complex for the mind to understand. Mysticists accept the idea that the mind is generated through our neurobiology, but say that reducing the mind to brain functions doesn't tell us about the subjective experience of consciousness and thus can't be used to study the entirety of the mind. A mysticist might say, I can understand my experience, but I will never know what it's really like to see life through someone else's eyes. But that may not be the case. Although it will take a few decades, neurotechnology might allow us to send experiences to others. If we are able to do this, we could determine if you can actually share experiences or if there is something innate to each person's individual experience. We will need a working definition of the mind before we can discuss it. In an effort to support all of these factions and our neurobiological understanding, let's think of the mind as a concept that represents our experience of consciousness, our personalities, identities, and memories. We can accept our understanding that the mind is generated by processes of the brain and that different areas influence different behaviors. The mind as a concept still affords us the ability to explore subjective experiences as a useful tool for studying the mind, such as is done in psychology. I'm sure we would all hope that neurotechnology would not change our personalities, but it could influence our identities, our perceptions of consciousness, and our memories. Let's start with identity, specifically how we perceive ourselves. We build our identities based on our beliefs, social affiliations, our interests, the values we hold, and the titles we give ourselves. All of these attributes are generated in the mind and contribute to our self-image. But the perception of our bodies also plays a major role. By perception of our bodies, I don't just mean thoughts like, oh, I'm too fat or too skinny, although that does factor in, but rather the unconscious model of our body the brain creates. The model that tells us, this is my arm, and that is not my arm. The model that recognizes itself when looking in a mirror. This is the mind-body problem revisited. Our identities are what we associate with our sense of self, that which, if we were to lose, we would feel different. If you meet somebody at a party, they would likely tell you about their profession, hobbies, politics, and their opinions. All of these are conceptual inventions, and it is in these inventions that we find ourselves. Even the parts of your identity that have anatomical roots, such as your arms, your smile, or your feet, seem to be strongly connected to the mental models of the mind. Several studies have shown that the brain is often overly willing to adopt external objects into its mental model. But is this mind-body model flexible? Could there be a point when we start to change our identities based on the technology our brains are connected to? This is also demonstrated in amputees with ghost limb syndrome. It is very common for amputees to still feel their lost limb. Some feel like they can control it, while others say that it is quite painful and locked into a position. Neuroscientists have tried to reorganize nerves at the site of amputation, but have had little success. We have since learned that this is because the mind's model of our bodies still includes the arm even though it's gone. One interesting way to combat this that suggests the mind-body model is malleable is mirror box therapy. Let's say that your left arm was amputated. You would be instructed to place your right arm on the table next to a mirror box and place the residual limb into the box, hiding it from your vision. Upon seeing a reflection of their right arm in a relaxed position where their left would be, they often feel their amputated ghost arm loosen up, stopping the pain. Of course, the amputee knows that this is just a reflection, but the mind-body model seems to adapt the reflected arm into its model. Similar results have been found using virtual reality. There are also several instances where individuals with assistive technology, like wheelchairs or prosthetics, 
start to feel that their technology is a part of them. After a few months to a year, many wheelchair and prosthetic users start to see their assistive tech in their dreams, suggesting that the brain believes it is now a part of them. More evidence that the brain's mental model is adaptable comes from the many papers related to sensory substitution. David Eagleman, a neuroscientist who has written extensively and worked on this topic, he's kind of the guy for this stuff, says that our senses can be expanded. That, with the right tools, nearly any data stream could be fed into the brain and interpreted as if it were a native sense. All of this, from sensation of a limb that is no longer there, the incorporation of non-biological objects into our mental models, and the flexibility of our senses, shows that our sense of self, what is and isn't us, can adapt. From this, we can extrapolate that our brains could merge with a brain-computer interface and actually make it a part of us. This is important as neurotechnology will allow us to control more and more machines. For some, like vehicle control, we might have to temporarily incorporate machines into our mind-body model to control it effectively. But if you are integrating your mind with technology, is it still your mind? Let's talk about cyborgs. The term cyborg was adapted from the term cybernetic organism, which was coined in 1960 by Manfred Kleins and Nathan S. Klein. Does anyone else find it odd that their last name sounds so similar? Anyway, they say that a cyborg refers to a being with biological and biomechatronic components. However, there is still debate about the extent of each of those. Some argue that to be a cyborg, an individual must have a certain percentage of their biological body replaced with artificial parts. While some have argued that we are already cyborgs every time we use a piece of technology. The first argument seems to be more accepted in the science fiction community. In various forms of visual media, we see beings that are quite visibly part human and part machine. Think of Robocop, whose body, but not mind, has been replaced by machines. The part that is less obvious is, at what percentage of human and machine does a person become a cyborg? Are there certain technologies that are more cyborgian than others? On the opposite end of the spectrum, some believe that the use of any tool is, in essence, an extension of that person. Technologies don't have to be as advanced as a computer or brain chip to be cyborgian. Philosophers of this school of thought might say that when we hold a hammer, in some small way it becomes a part of us, an extension or modification to ourselves in order to complete a task. In their view, a cyborg. This definition has gained more popularity as we grapple with our relationship to smartphones and digital technologies. Many argue that smartphones have become a part of us in that we use them to store memories, communicate, and navigate, and we would likely struggle more in their absence now than we would have previously. Some see this as a positive, arguing that delegating these tasks to technology frees up our minds to do other tasks while others think that the reliance on technology degrades human traits and intellect. So, what do you think? Do you agree with either of these schools of thought? Or do you have different ideas? What is your definition of a cyborg? What implications does your definition have? Okay, so we've talked about cyborgs, but what is a human? Is it simply a more casual way to say the biological term homo sapien? Well, if we dig into our history and our language, we see that the term is broader than just that. The terms human and humanness have been used to advance ideologies and often to lift up or degrade certain groups of people. There are countless examples where one group of homo sapiens has looked at another and said, ah yes, they are less than us. They are less than human. We also have words like superhuman to mean greater than human and inhuman or inhumane to mean not human. All of these terms, though, are generally describing an action. I can't believe he did that, it's inhumane, or she had superhuman intelligence. Both of these actions, the positive and negative, are carried out by people. But some actions we assign are less than human and others we say are more than human. Maybe we can think of being human then as an expression of the mind. Maybe consciousness is synonymous with humanness. If this is the case, though, could an advanced artificial intelligence algorithm become human by showing advanced cognition? Also, this definition leads out people in comas. I certainly wouldn't want to revoke their humanness because they are not conscious. 
When thinking about the question, I find it helpful to talk about human essence, what traits, actions, and ideas contribute to our human model. So, what do you think? How would you define human essence? Perhaps, more importantly, how is this concept influenced by technology? Does advancing technology and our increased reliance on it make us more or less human? Finally, where are the boundaries of your definition? I hope that you have enjoyed this philosophical and ethical journey. Like you, I am excited where advanced technologies can expand upon our abilities. Neurotechnology will define the rest of this century and I don't want to slow its progress. But I hope in watching this video that you have a greater understanding of the potential risks and why, when dealing with the brain and mind, we should think very critically about the technology we produce. If you're interested in talking about neuroethics further, we'll provide some links below to organizations and communities that talk about this sort of thing.